All right. So uh, that was just a technical intro. Uh, I think first participants, uh, uh, registered participants are joining us uh, on Zoom. So let me welcome you to uh, one more, just another, uh, or not just another, to one more uh, uh, discussion organized by Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Slovakia and Euractive Slovakia. Uh, this time we'll focus on the uh, climate policy, but not uh, as a policy, but as a communication topic. So the the title of the of the online seminar of webinar is Protecting Climate with Public Support, How to Communicate Successful Ambitious uh, Green Policies. Uh, as the title says, we'll focus more on the communication of the climate policy than the, uh, the content of the climate, uh, climate policies. And I think uh, this discussion is quite due now because uh, we could remember a few years ago, like let's say 10 years or, or 15 years ago, uh, we already knew quite a lot about the uh, about the uh, the threats uh, posed by the by the climate change, but still it wasn't felt as kind of a priority, uh, political priority. Scientists, we knew we knew the science uh, behind the climate change. Uh, we knew that something should be done and there were uh, uh, discussions on from national to, to, to global level on how to formulate successful climate policies but there was no this kind of sense of, of urgency uh, i think the situation has changed now and we are facing a very different uh, world now uh, so uh, climate change is recognized as one of the top politi political priorities if not globally in europe uh, at least uh, we have uh, an ongoing uh, global uh, uh, global discussion about discussions about climate policies, and also the Europe has embarked on ambitious plan for green transformation of the economy. Uh, nevertheless, uh, these policies will probably not be successful if they lack public support. So that's why we'll try to focus on uh, we'll try to focus on finding ways how to communicate successful, ambitious green policies. And we have a very good panel for that now. Uh, uh, so before we start, let me introduce the, the speakers. Uh, I will just use the order how it's uh, how it's written in the, in the invitation. So first, let me introduce Mr. Martin Martin Hoysig, member of the European Parliament from the Renew Europe Group. Hello, Martin. Good morning, Bran. Uh, then we have Eva Junge, uh, climate psychologist. Hello. Morning. Uh, Thorsten Schaffer, professor of journalism, uh, specialized on eco journalism. Hello, Thorsten. Hello. Good morning. Uh, and Brian Fitzgerald, story hacker and communication expert. Hi, Brian. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Radovan Gaze. I'm working for Euractive Slovakia. Uh, I'll be moderating this discussion. Uh, ah, yes, Martin Hoysik, he's not only from Renew Europe, he's mm -hmm. also from the, uh, from the party Progressive Slovakia. Uh, so uh, before we start, let me give a word to, uh, to Robert Janoni from Friedrich Heber Stiftung Bratislava. Uh, because he has done, uh, since I know him, he was doing a lot about the communication policy, political communication, uh, and uh, recently he was focusing on communicating climate policies, uh, preparing or, or co-authoring uh, a manual for, for communication. Um, so, Robert, please, if you could introduce the, uh, the, uh, the topic and, and open the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Rado, very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good late morning. Uh, just really, just a couple of just a couple of words. As Rado already uh, spoke about the purpose of this meeting and the discussion, uh, I just want to use these two or three minutes to uh, advertise in a good way uh, two publications from uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Uh, one is a 140 pages manual argumentation manual for uh, for. Uh, Sorry, oh, this is it. This is it. Okay, uh, manual for uh, climate action, social just. It's it's a collaboration of actually six or seven uh, FES offices with uh, some external experts. Like we have one in our panel. Uh, it presents not not really policy, but really uh, arguments, best cases, uh, data, contra arguments. For everybody who is concerned with uh, with climate policy, stakeholders, decision makers, but is a really uh, a bit maybe hesitant or skeptical about the reaction of the public that deals with the public, so it's really an offer for uh, for this kind of people. We we uh, wrote this manual with our external experts with two principles actually. 
uh, which is one, it should not be abstract, not uh, this international agreements. And no, uh, one of the main authors said it, no polar bears, but really concrete, tangible uh, consequences of climate changes, but also benefits from climate policy uh, measures. Uh, it's, it's divided into seven chapters. So it's, it's really full of data, facts, best cases, counter arguments. It's, it's an offer for, 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 for people. And the second uh, thing is a small, very well written. It's in German now. We will translate the first one and the second one in November in, in uh, Slovak language and distribute it. It's about five French uh, municipalities that has done very much in terms of uh, climate policy, uh, many measures, and uh, I think four or three or four of them have been re-elected in, the, in uh, this year's uh, municipal elections. So they know how also how to communicate them. So this is basically an offer from, from the Friedrich Stiftung. Uh, I'm happy that we are here together and uh, I'm looking forward uh, to a two hours interesting discussion. Thank you, Rana. Thank you very much. So I think now we can we can uh, start a panel discussion. Um, um, before we start, just a few technical remarks. Uh, so we'll start with the panel presentations and quick quick reactions of the speakers, uh, and then the floor is open for your comments and questions. Uh, you can use the Q and A button, which is at the bottom of the screen, uh, and uh, we'll also use questions that were. Uh, posted uh, through the registration forms uh, when you have registered for, for this event. Um, so without much further ado, I think we can start. Uh, and we will start with Martin Hoysik, who is uh, actually, let's say, communication practitioner, <laughs> not only as a member of the European Parliament, but uh, even before when he was active uh, in uh, actually green NGOs and other social justice NGOs. So he has a rich experience with communication. Um, so Martin, you are now a member of the European Parliament from Renew Europe, uh, Progressive Slovakia uh, uh, group. Uh, but um, maybe you can also share some experiences uh, from your previous career as a, let's say, activist, uh, uh, an NGO organizer, uh, and, and how it, you think it could help uh, uh, with the communication of, of green policies. Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you, Radovan, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be panelists on this really, really interesting uh, topic. And indeed, yes, I've been uh, active in the environmental and social justice movements since uh, early 90s. Uh, I work with, with Brian here, uh, and I actually haven't been really so much communicator. I have done some communication work back in the late 90s. Uh, my domain was campaigns. So how to do the check, how to actually push from a position of not having power uh, changes uh, and convince and uh, the those who in who have the power to to make those changes. And this is not possible without communication. I think that's one of the uh, big strengths in Greenpeace that the, from beginning understood. Uh, and I've been well almost twenty years uh, with Greenpeace. Uh, they understood the connection between the, uh, the kind of pressure and, uh, and communication, between the desire to change things and communication. Now, it's very interesting for me to see the different perspectives now when, when I'm uh, in politics, uh, to see how one is uh, trying to communicate things, but at the same time, it's a subject and target of campaign communication by the NGOs. And actually, I always call on people when I'm when I'm talking, uh, I'm meeting uh, uh, meeting uh, people, uh, especially in Slovakia. I'm asking them for one thing: please keep up the pressure. Please, including me, uh, keep the pressure on the politicians, so we don't forget why are we here. And I think this is very very important. But to get to the topic on how to how to do effective communication, I would uh, start, especially regarding climate, with one very important thing, uh, and that is, we have to always remember that uh, it's, the golden rule is to make the very complicated topics simple, and it's not because you know people can't comprehend; um, it's because this is something where 
for most of the people, the topic that you want to talk about is not necessarily the priority. And why should it be? Yeah. So to get to them, uh, you have to simplify. You have to get it into what I call the human language. And it's not uh, only about climate. You have to translate it into something more tangible, into into stories. But I'm not going to be going into Brian's stuff because I'm sure he's going to talk about stories. And to give you a very concrete example from my past work is. Uh, as, a, as a campaigner, I worked on the European chemicals policy. And I used to always say that these are one of the three most boring words known to man. Now, the best way to talk to people about European chemicals policy is not to mention European chemicals policy. You talk about hazardous chemicals in everyday life, and that actually we need to get rid of that, that we need a simple rule of you have something causing cancer, you have something which does the same thing and doesn't cause cancer, the cancer causing should be banned, right? That's common sense, but that's not the rule. We need to change the rules, so this is happening. Now, the same in some way applies to climate, although differently. Yes, we should not talk about polar bears, uh, although they became uh, sort of a symbol because everybody talks so much about them. Uh, we should bring the story home and we should Maybe sometimes, and that's what always the experts are tearing their heads out, uh, oversimplified, because, and, and maybe even turn it around a bit, because that's what people care about. Um, it's essentially about uh, understanding who you talk to. That's, I think, the very first step. Who is your target group, and what is your operating environment, so to say? What are the conditions? What is the public discourse on the topic in, in the area uh, uh, where, or in, within the audience that you want to uh, bring it uh, across? Uh, and that will help you to um, uh, try to formulate on how you want to talk about it. You're going to be talking differently to a group of concerned uh, you, young people and differently to um, mothers with children and differently to, I would say, uh, managers of companies. And I think this is something which uh, it's very important to understand as a as, as first step. People, people, people overlook it. Second thing is we are not uh, hardwired to uh, understand the, the systemic complexities. We understand causality. This is you know, I'm studying genetics, uh, and I'm, so that's why I'm, I'm close to uh, biology. And I became fan of George Lakoff and his approach to communication. And yes, we understand when I take this cup and let it go, it falls down and spills the coffee on my lap. But the fact that I drive a car and this is increasing the emissions of greenhouse gases, and that is actually causing not just melting of the glaciers, but the flood that has. Uh, just ruined the town I live in. Uh, so to say, that's something which is beyond comprehension. And it's not easy, even possible to say in that straight way if you want to be scientifically correct. So the, the really important thing is how you simplify uh, and yet stay correct. And the last point, because I'm realizing I talk too much, um, is about the balance between what I call the doom and gloom and hope. What we face is a uh, existential threat to the society. We maybe could have been softer 20 years ago, but right now, where are we? It's something which it's beyond actually really comprehension what can happen to the civilization. We probably were not gonna, we might, but we might probably not gonna destroy the entire life of the planet, but the civilization as we know it, if we don't do things now, it's gonna end. As a father of two children, this is something really, really scary to say. But this is what is a scientific consensus. But people are not, in my view, able to operate in such a situation. You're just People just shut down the communication. It's too much. People just shut down. The good news is that, and I'm still hopeful about this, is that if we start doing things right, we can not only avert the worst. It's going to be bad, but it, uh, it might not have to be that bad but we can make the society so much better. And I think this is what we need to get across to different groups of people. It can help, it can make your life better. Making your homes energy efficient will lower your energy bills. 
and help to you know lower the emissions. So I think the last message is don't give give people hope and motivate them to go and fight for the hope. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll uh, be returning to this mixture of urgency and hope uh, quite often in this discussion and also the notion of uh, giving a positive case for, for change. Um, so uh, now I would like to uh, invite uh, Eva Junge, climate psychologist, uh, uh, to, to give her presentation. Um, um, it's, uh, we could say, uh, um, um, communication policy based on, um, let's say, latest knowledge from uh, social psychology or percep perceptual psychology. So, Eva, the floor is yours. Okay, I hope you can hear me now. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you, uh, first of all, to uh, Martin. I think there's a lot of similar uh, topics that I also thought about talking now. Uh, I work as an environmental psychologist, so I work on the interplay between psychology and environmental protection. I have co-founded a collective um, that tries to bring our psychological knowledge into applied environmental action. And I've been part of the climate justice movement for about the last five years. And one thing that always interested me was the kind of stories that we tell as a movement, because what I often see and what I assume many of you also know are these kind of images that we see often portrayed in the media around catastrophe and disaster. And I think this makes sense because we live in an incredibly unjust and violent world. So in a way it makes sense that these images are part of our media coverage. And at the same time, from a psychological uh, perspective, I think it's very important to question whether this actually is a smart strategy because these kind of images and stories elicit uncomfortable emotions like grief, anxiety, fear, helplessness, which make people often rather withdraw from the issue at stake, especially because we have learned growing up in a society that rather looks away or doesn't actually act upon it to use emotional focused coping strategies. So the stronger this uncomfortable emotion, the more likely I am to try to pull away from it. And for me, it's really interesting to wonder how we can tell a different story that rather inspires people to get active. So there could be stories around hope and community, solidarity, showing that people actually already do something, that people can be part of something bigger, where they can actually have an impact beyond simply um, using a reusable coffee cup, but actually doing something where they feel like they can make an impact. And I think this is a complex topic, especially when we talk about emotions, because obviously those uncomfortable emotions that I showed in the first place also are in some ways really relevant and have their function. So I put purposely here an image of people protesting, because when we go out onto the streets and ask people what makes them join a protest, for example, we see that anger is a very driving emotion. And anger in a way could also be very uncomfortable to feel, but it leads people somewhere. Whereas, for example, hope and grief, um, uh, not hope, helplessness and grief do not really. So I think that this is a really important thing to consider. What kind of emotions do we want to provoke in people? The next thing that I want to talk about is that we all grow up in a society where we learn to lead a very unsustainable lifestyle. And the habits that we have are a very cheap way to get through the day because we don't really need to challenge what we do. We don't need to reflect on it. We can just go onto this autopilot of, I do what, what I always do. And as communicators, I think it makes a lot of sense to make it easier for people to change what they do, to really focus on the very big points that actually make a big difference when we try to reduce carbon footprints. So here we can talk about living, alimentation, mobility, and of course also about um, living in an active democracy and getting out, to, out onto the streets, protesting, maybe also donating and um, joining other projects. And last but not least, I wanna talk about values, which I find a very fascinating concept. So here you can see a universal network of values that we all share regardless of our cultural background or generation. And as climate change communicators, it makes sense for us to focus on altruistic and biospheric values and try to rather neglect the egoistic values. 
So what you see in the upper right corner in the green, the universalism and benevolence values are value clusters that talk around about equality, protecting the environment, justice. And these are values that resonate with all of us. And when we activate those values, in a way, we also deactivate the opposing values like achievement and power, which, uh, as we can see, have a lot of harmful influence on our um, audience. And similar uh, to what Martin just said, it's also important to think about the target group. So is it, some, is it the group of people that um, is drawn towards change and really f finds it appealing, this idea of a big transformation, then we can use values around self-direction, stimulation, adventure, or is it maybe a target group that rather tries to um, prevent change and protect what is achieved, then we rather focus on uh, tradition and security. And this is again about the story that we want to tell. So um, I also believe in this idea that the future belongs to uh, the one that tells the better story. And I feel like there we can all learn to become better storytellers of the socio-environmental transformation that we want to work towards. Thank you very much. That was uh, quick, but very, really full of information. Uh, this is fine. Uh, uh, so thank you. And uh, yes, I like the focus on uh, storytelling based uh, uh, or uh, kind of rooted in the, uh, in the understanding of, of human values uh, and, uh, and also focus on the changes that we could do uh, in our everyday lives. Um, now we'll move uh, to journalism. Uh, uh, Mr. Thorsten Schaeffer is the professor of journalism, specialized in eco-journalism. Uh, just a personal story, uh, I started writing for different journals, media back in 2001, and the uh, kind of eco uh, uh, topics were uh, one of my focuses. Uh, and I remember back then it was very different uh, than now. I mean, we were writing about things that were happening in far off places uh, of the earth or uh, things were, that were more emotional than touching the everyday lives uh, of uh, people, let's say, in, in Europe. Uh, but I guess the situation has changed. So I would give the floor to Mr. Thorsten Schäffer uh, and, um, and his uh, approach from, uh, from, from the journalism. Thorsten, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I have to share, first of all, my screen with you. Um, give me a second. So do you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, thank you also to invite me for this talk and this discussion. That's great. We don't have so much time, so I try to be quite brief and maybe also a bit quick at the same time, like Eva did. So um, I'm a journalist, an environmental journalist now for more than 20 years, and I'm teaching much um, within this context of climate and environmental communication, and especially journalism. But I'm also a writer and journalist still at the same time, so I'm writing books nature writing with um, a climate context. Um, so I just want to mention quickly that um, even if we talk a lot about negative aspects and also, um, yeah, catastrophe and um, disaster, uh, it's not the only thing we can discover once we just talk about climate communication. In Germany and other neighbor countries, there is a certain rise of environmental communication, environmental journalism, climate reporting within the media scene. It's not something you see from the outside. It, it happens as a loose network that is uh, building itself somehow now for some 10 years. But um, this is something that is important to know just as one slide, as one point, that there is a association for environmental topics, for journalism and sustainability. We have more and more vocational trainings and um, seminars for younger journalists. We have new specialized media like Green Journalism. That's the website I'm running here at the university. So there's a lot that is somehow um, growing and developing in the backyard so that you don't see from front door, but it's somehow um, encouraging, motivating us within this media network and um, dealing with green topics. So here you see some um, 
of the media, green media that have risen in Germany in the last years. That's my portal, Green Journalism. It's especially made for tr training purposes. So we do a lot of um, environmental journalism with our students, but also we invite other universities to um, publish their dossiers, their um, special stories about climate change also on this website. But we have a, a lot of interviews with environmental journalists and other communicators as well. Also science communication is one field we're working in. This is uh, something I could recommend to everybody if you, it's called Clean Energy Wire. It's um, a website that is translating the German energy um, shift and transition, but also climate topics in English to, um, yeah, to the international public, especially it's made for journalists, but also politicians. Clean Energy Wire is a very good tool for investigation for everybody. Um, so what is climate change as a media topic? Um, just to come to my five or six key points, um, it is linked with a universal value we are just discovering now, which is sustainability. So climate action is the practical perspective and sustainability is a universal value like a democracy, peace or gender equality. Um, one of the main results of my work here of the last eight years or even more is um, that you can't um, uh, do climate actions, climate communication without um, somehow relying on the ethical level. And here we have sustainability as a universal value within international treaties, constitutions. There are a lot of um, economical um, evidences show, that show us that we have here a rise of a new universal value for, um, let's say, uh, lots of countries. This is an ethical, a philosophical um, debate, but um, I'm, I can't explain my um, points and my um, ideas without just touching this. So there's much more to do than only talking about communication. It's uh, somehow um, an ethical debate um, that is um, somehow the basis. What is really important is to get away from this triangle of sustainability in all this communication work because um, it's um, still dominant in all the talks and lots of books that somehow um, ecology and society and economy have to come together. This is the so-called triangle of sustainability, but it's nonsense, even if we talk a lot about it, because we have today um, the planetary boundaries that have um, much a focus on yeah the, the boundaries of the planet, of the, the Earth system. And there is a clear ecological priority within um, all the climate um, thinkings we're doing and uh, within the concept of sustainability. Fortunately, we have new concepts of sustainability relying on this ecological priority that is based on these so-called planetary boundaries that were published in 2009 by Rockström, an environmental researcher, um, so 11 years ago. And now we have other um, concepts, but please, the ecology is a priority. That's the planet, that's our framework for everything we do. It's not economy, it's not society. Society is very important, also economy, but it's not the basic layer. Um, and what is very important is to stress that, and this may be the key result of my work is that once you communicate climate topics, climate related topics, the, the key thought is to think of a single topic. We have to learn a dimensional thinking. And that's the key for it, even for journalists, for um, communicators within municipalities or scientific communities. It is not a topic. Climate is not a topic. It is a dimension, a holistic dimension. It is a context and the key context for life on this planet today. And the key context for every kind of communication we're doing, even if it's social communication or um, economical communication or about health, climate, and this has to be linked also with um, the loss of species. So it's not only about climate, is about the ecological question. So um, we, have to, we have to bring the species and the loss of species that is even more a problem maybe than climate consequences. So we, have, we are shifting towards a new ecological period next year after 12,000 years. We're not at all able to understand what this means to us, but we can start to think about it. And so it's all about the dimension. It's not a single topic. Once you think of it as a single topic, you bring it in competition with other topics, and then it's gonna it's gonna be a loss because it's much more it's much more complicated and much more meaningful than a single topic. Climate is not a topic. Um, so it's a question how to frame it, how to name it. Um, if it's always should be always in um, the um, headline, or if it's somehow a context that could also be not named within a communication within a reportage. And unfortunately, um, Martin Heusig said it. You don't have to bring the you in a headline of a good you reporting when you want to make people understand the European Union. I worked a lot as a journalist and a trainer about European communication. 
So it's just that you can learn a lot of it. So think if it's really the story, if it's about the new climate um, summit on the international level, then climate is a topic, then it's in the headline. Or if it's a context, you have to find. And so the key um, task for our communication is to contextualize our smaller angles and topics with the big climate or ecological framework um, and, and context. Um, yeah, climate change is not easy to understand, attractive, sexy. It's not full of stars. Now we have Creta. It's, for a long time, we didn't have stars. When you want to tell a story, you need a place, you need a hero, and you need an action. And we, don't, we didn't have so many heroes in the last year. So Al Gore got too old. Now we have Greta and other national um, Friday for Future people. So they are heroes, but you have to um, also find them still even on the local level. It's, not, uh, it's getting old somehow, climate as the context. And um, yeah, I come to this later on, but um, it's not a question mainly of technology and economy. It's a question of culture, of society. Still have one minute, okay. It's much about um, uh, also translating to find a simple language. This is what we have already um, said. And that's the new structure of climate change. Um, it's much difficult, it's much different to the new structure of um, uh, environmental disasters, which it, it explains us again that it's a dimension and it's not a topic. A storytelling is important, so I sh uh, skip this a bit, but we should not overestimate the power of stories because you have to have other influential factors to make uh, a change in behavior than only communication. Um, I had a research project of climate stories here in the last years. Some key findings, uh, I, I was talking about the context. I was talking about um, uh, giving back time to people in, a red, in editorial um, offices, but also in universities to communicate climate change and the uh, single topics. Um, and to broaden the narrative, that's maybe one very important thing, uh, but we had it with the values. So um, climate communication is getting much more a local topic. If we want to have real an impact within a country, we have to relocalize it. That's what is happening. And for this, you have to find the trusted communicators in a certain region, in the municipality, and to think about their values. So maybe um, about older people, about people from rural landscape, um, uh, from local communities, and um, to, to also somehow place it in their words, in their values. And so if I was talking about this, and this is my approach to change the narr narratives, not only about um, economy and about um, technology, but much more about local narratives, ethical dimensions, but cultural and um, uh, also um, social um, patterns are really important. And what is very well working as a new narrative somehow is health. Um, when, you when you link it with the local climate consequences that we are facing dramatically in Europe, then health is one thing and agriculture is one thing. But the most important thing I had here, I was in Vietnam, and but it doesn't play a role. Um, what is important is to link it with hope as Eva said, to find a constructive communication on the local level, which does not mean to have a positive communication because climate change is always um, a menace. It's somehow um, a dramatic um, uh, development for societies, for our single life. But there's always um, a, a dimension of life quality in, of freedom. And we have to tell this, this other story to make of the the, story, the narrative of um, catastrophe, of um, renouncing on things on uh, as the whole disaster story. We have to add to this, not to replace it fully. That's not possible. We have to add a message of life quality and a freedom of gaining back our life, gaining back our time. It's very good to combine climate education with slow slowing down and all this um, narrative of acceleration and also to re relocate us. Um, this is all what we did in the Corona crisis to find, to bring us back to nature somehow. And my last uh, thing would be, I'm over uh, running out of time, I know. Once we want to learn a different climate communication, we have to bring it back to the local um, places where the consequences of, um, are to be seen in Europe. And this means, learning means to go out you only learn a different language when you want to uh, communicate climate differently when you go out. Because our language is full of um, expressions that nobody really understands, full of technical speech, climate speech, of startup um, uh, words that are not really um, a lively language, that are not really easy to understand. It's not a blossoming language. And when I, well, I do more and more in my work with my students, but also with journalists and other groups, I go out and make them think about and practice another language in the woods. 
that's what I'm doing right now. Okay, thank you very much. This was really full of information. I'll just uh, pick up a few and um, I'm sure we'll get back to it in discussion to, to many aspects you haven't been able to, uh, to explain in more detail because of uh, our time is a uh, little limited. So uh, just, to, uh, just to, to, to pick out uh, some of the things you said, uh, the importance of going local, not in terms of the stories we tell, but also the language we use, uh, uh, the message of uh, uh, life quality and freedom, which, uh, well, the green, green transition is not only about sacrifices, it's also about finding a, a new uh, quality of life, broadened narrative, and uh, let's say uh, this um, focus on, uh, on the ecology, uh, which is not just one aspect uh, of the story it's, um, uh, and the need of the, the holistic approach. Uh, okay, we will move to, to the last speaker. Uh, I think we can stop uh, sharing the screen. Um, okay, thank you. So we'll move to the last speaker, uh, Brian Fitzgerald, uh, story hacker and communications expert. Um, so uh, uh, Thorsten talked a bit about the stories. He said also that we should not uh, overestimate the power of the stories, but at the same time, he also said if uh, that stories are important. Uh, I have to say that one of my favorite authors is uh, Jar Diamond. Of course, he has been criticized uh, uh, for taking some facts uh, wrong and so on. But I think his books, which are based on stories uh, from the history of, of mankind, um, provide quite kind of uh, convincing argument for, for example, uh, finding a better balance with the with the environment. Um, so. Uh, now I would give floor to Brian uh, and uh, um, uh, for him to give uh, his, uh, his story about the, uh, the communication of, of, of climate policies, please. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you, Martin, Ava, and Torsten. My neck is hurting from vigorous nodding in agreement. Um, I'm director of uh, Dancing Fox. We're a, a storytelling agency in Amsterdam that works exclusively with NGOs, social change artists, people working for a better world. I'm not a climate expert. I'm not a journalist, um, but I'm someone who's come to believe in the power of story to shape our sense of what's right, what's normal, and what's possible. And to believe that's a more powerful engine of change than anything I did in my uh, history as a lifelong activist. Um, I was a, a Greenpeace campaigner and a communicator for 35 years, worked with Martin. Um, I was part of a movement in an organization that you know, changed government and corporate policies and transformed entire sectors. And I'll always be proud of what we achieved together and what the movement achieved. But when you get as old as I am, you start to look back and ex assess things with a colder eye. And um, you know, we failed to deliver the transformational change that really was needed to get us out of the, the climate fix that we're in. You know, at Greenpeace, we started to wake up to and raise the alarm about uh, climate change in the late 80s. You know, we published reports, we pointed fingers, we named names, we boarded oil rigs, we blocked tankers. So why didn't we get through? Why is climate change still not the priority it should be? And why can't I look my kids in the eye and tell them that their world is safe? Well, I think it's because we have chipped away at, but we have not changed the fundamental story that is the operating system of today's world. The mythology, if you will, that, that we've collectively agreed. Um, we all know that mythologies that explain the world come and go. You know, Neptune's rage and Odin's thunder are notifications on our cell phones now. Prometheus's fire is a plastic lighter in our pockets. Um, but the great gods of consumerism and infinite growth are still running the show. Um, Greta Thunberg is a child, but she accused all of us who still make decisions based on a model of infinite growth as living in a fairy tale. And she's right, but nobody gives up a fairy tale that explains their life, much less their civilization, until a better story comes along. 
So we're living in what Jonah Sachs calls a, a myth gap a between time when the old stories stop explaining the world and before a new story has taken hold in the mainstream. And that new story is out there. It's on the fringe. It's the Green New Deal. It's donut economics. It's Yuval Harari's satellite view of human history as you know, human beings becoming increasingly empathetic, generous, and peaceful, and overcoming the obstacles to our survival. But those stories are competing with consumption makes us happy, retail therapy, make America great again, Brexit style nationalist isolationism, and the greenwash versions of sustainable growth. And that might be okay if we were moving towards a middle ground, but sometimes it feels like it's hardly even a dialogue. So here's what I think is wrong. We still believe that facts are gonna win this. Um, they do win in policy circles, among journalists and people who care about facts. They do not win in public communications. And if that makes you angry as it does me, it's because of this cognitive dissonance. We all have this irrational emotional attachment to rationality. We think that if we get the facts out there, things will change because it's so glaringly obvious. But you know, we've eroded our ability to work together across values disagreements. Um, Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind talks about the existential threat that political polarization represents in a time of climate change when the extremes of our political views no longer compromise or even converse, we lose a fundamental survival mechanism, the correction of extremes through compromise. And when Ava was talking about speaking you know, to those values of, of conformity and tradition, that's so essential and it's so hard for us to do because so many of us in the progressive world don't share those values. Um, we're bombarded with bad news um, and we've become numb to the existential threats that we're facing. And that's partially because we've perfected these systems of delivering bad news in real time. And we've ignored that fundamental need for hope. So we're swimming in this sea of invisible stories that things that don't exist in nature, whether it's the days of the week to the modern corporation, to the idea of that growth is good. They're all just stories that we've we collectively agreed are true, but they shape our sense of what's right, what's normal and what's possible. And that's what shapes our behavior. So we need to change the water. And here's five things that I think we can do. Um, let's get away from the military model of winning the argument by annihilating the enemy and change the setting to a community mode of cooperation towards solution for our mutual survival. And start, we need to start behaving like people should in a crisis and like people generally do in a crisis. Um, like the Dutch did in the face of uh, seawater that was rising and didn't give a damn about their politics. They agreed to disagree, but to do something. Uh, two, stop thinking that the remedy is more facts. You know, in the US in the 80s and 90s, health officials were battling smoking rates by making um, fact after fact and report after report public. They um, shifted policymakers. They didn't make a dent in public behavior. What did make a dent was taxes on cigarettes and smoke-free workplaces, restaurants, and public buildings, which changed people's perception from smoking being normal to it being pushed to the fringe. Um, we're far more compelled to behave, behave in ways that we perceive to be normal than we are to behave in ways that our rational brains tell us are right. So as climate communicators, we need to find those smoke-free zones, the ways legislators can help the public see the urgency of the fight against climate change as normal and as happening all around them. Um, three, the more we show the herd turning, the faster the herd will turn. These days, you need to look really hard for hope. Hope is not news. The news still focuses, as our brains do, on threat. And because we're still evolutionarily still out there on the savanna, um, competing with creatures that are faster uh, and have really sharp claws and teeth. But while you know, our hypersensitivity to threat has not evolved, our senses have, and we've created a mechanism that helps us scan not just the immediate horizon for threat, but the entire planet. Um, we need to retune the antennas of what human beings pay attention to and find and amplify those weak signals of hope. Um, 
George Marshall has done some amazing work on how to talk to conservatives about climate change and how differently a conservative UK voter will respond if you pose fracking as a threat to the environment, which they don't care about, you've lost them, that's not their tribal concern. Um, but if you talk about fracking as a violation of the sanctity of the land, you're speaking to their traditional values and that wins. Um, and when I say hack mainstream culture, I don't mean ham-fisted efforts like the day after tomorrow, I mean, painting concern and action about climate into the background of our entire cultural experience. Again, making it seem normal to be taking action at a personal policy and corporate level. Um, and finally, you know, uh, we need to stop focusing on people shouting fire and start focusing on people who are grabbing buckets. Um, it's not only the best way to get past our doom exhaustion and the brain's flight mechanism, which uh, Torsten was talking about, it's actually essential to winning. You know, Kubi Naidu uh, tells a story about his early days as an apartheid activist when he was uh, told his cause was just, but it was hopeless. And for a hundred years that had been true. But as Kumi put it, it was only when people in large numbers came to believe that change was possible, that change became possible. We need to amplify stories of heroic behavior to make that change possible. So this is the challenge, finding a story to replace consumerism in our private and public lives, a story which is exciting and attractive and inspiring. And if that seems impossible, that's actually, as I see it, a cause for hope. Um, as one of my personal heroes put it, uh, Bob Hunter, one of the founders of Greenpeace, every cause in the history of activism from women's rights to ending apartheid to gay marriage to, uh, uh, to gay marriage in Ireland seemed impossible at the outset. But when we look back, we think, of course, that would have changed. Of course, people would have stood up against that. But in their time, those stories were impossible dreams. And the people who spoke out were considered fringe. So for all of us who are on that fringe today, I take some comfort thinking that these times will be looked back on and people will say, of course, that economic, would, economic model would fall. Of course, the fossil fuels and meat-based agriculture would have been cast aside because there's obviously better ways to run a planet. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, it started with changing the story, but at the end, uh, it's about complete uh, reversal of the system, <laughs> economic and social, uh, including the everyday habits. So uh, yes, uh, if that's possible, stories uh, have a real power. Um, now, uh, we have finished the first round of uh, uh, of presentations. Uh, so if there are any reactions from the panelists to what the other speakers said, uh, we can do it now and then we'll move to questions. So anybody? Uh, well, if not, if there are no specific, uh, uh, specific reactions now, we can move, uh, we can move probably to, uh, to the uh, to the questions. We already have a couple of them uh, uh, from uh, the uh, registered participants. One of them is directly to Mr. Hoysik, but I think um, it could be also answered uh, by the others. Uh, and it talks about the ability of democracy uh, to cope with the climate and uh, biodiversity crisis. Uh, so, um, and this is something we hear quite often. Uh, is the democracy uh, well equipped uh, to, uh, to cope with uh, the crisis of these dimensions, uh, to bring this like real substantial change to the uh, way uh, we conduct our lives, to the economy and so on and so forth. So that's the first question. Uh, the second one is uh, about the uh, communication uh, of uh, air pollution uh, and uh, I think how it's related to the uh, to the climate change, whether uh, the communication uh, is uh, uh, confusing or misleading, uh, or it's uh, correctly uh, uh, or it's communicated communicated correctly by the media and political political actors. Uh, and I would add one more question, uh, which is from uh, from the registrations, uh, and this would. Actually, uh, uh, this would actually be related to uh, to the last presentation. So, one of the participants was asking 
whether the whole story about sustainable development and decoupling is not just a myth and we have to get rid of it. Uh, and when we are saying that we have to get rid of it, we are talking actually about a huge challenge uh, to, uh, to the uh, structure of the economy and, uh, and our every, everyday life. Uh, so the question was whether uh, changing the communication uh, is enough or can, could achieve this fundamental change uh, to the economy and, and as I said, uh, the, the way of our lives. So we have three questions. Uh, we'll start with uh, Martin and uh, unless somebody wants to like really speak, we'll uh, use the same order as the beginning. So Martin. Uh, thank you. And uh, just one thing, it's, yeah, I, I uh, share Brian's view on the, and I think that's why there were no more comments on the on the presentation, is that uh, it was so much interesting insights uh, from all of you. So so thank you very much for that. Now, uh, to start with the democracy, I don't know. We, 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 there is no way of telling. And I think what one of the fundamentally positive things about democracy is, we actually can, for example, have this discussion. Let's be honest. Uh, without liberal democracy, we probably wouldn't be in jail. You know, I grew up in a totalitarian regime, uh, as, as many of, you know, my, everybody of my generation back home. And uh, this is where, yeah, uh, the uh, communist regime was not very kind to the environment. We had massive pollution issues that were covered up. And those speaking up in... Uh, in defense of the nature, uh, we're having troubles. Uh, and that's something which just, you know, it doesn't really work. And I know that there's been uh, already back in 90s, uh, especially in some of the Czech environmental circles, uh, among the philosophers questions, whether we don't need, so to say, a wise dictatorship, uh, whether we don't need a system where, you know, the wise men or women and women would rule and, and do the right things. But what guarantees us that these people would be wise? Uh, democracy is not easy and it's not the best. Uh, we have to just come up with something better. And I think that's the, the beauty of it. That's what we need to push, just like we are pushing for the change uh, in terms of how the economy works and how the society works in terms of the climate. This includes the way that we have to challenge ourselves and we have to challenge the way the society and the governance operates. There's been recently very interesting, and it's a bit connected to the question of, of the growth, uh, and a study from a, from a think tank called Rethink X. Uh, and they've been quite controversial on, uh, on uh, their predictions, but it's turned out to be a, a number of things right. And we indeed are living in, a, in an age of disruption, not just in the ways of stories, not just in the ways of the societal narratives, uh, and uh, the threats to the society like the climate change when we are hitting the, well, hitting we beyond the limits of, of, of this planet, but also the way of, uh, the amount of knowledge we have, the amount of technological changes that we're facing are rapidly progressing. It's causing fundamental disruptions to the society. Uh, if you look really deep at what, for example, the uh, smartphone cost, in terms of the changes to from banking system to uh, the restaurant and kind of hospitality business, it's really fundamental and no one predicted that. Now, the question is how we can really help to push the direction of these changes so we ensure that uh, the life on this planet survives and that we kind of work within uh, the planetary limits that really change the narrative of society. And it might look like a massive, massive task, but uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, I, I share Brian's hope. Uh, at the same time, I have the, the clause of, well, uh, at least I tried. If I'm, when I'm going to be dying and tell myself, okay, maybe I didn't change everything I wanted, but I tried. And that's for my own conscience. Um, so I think the possibility is, is there to change things. We don't know exactly how things will look like. But I think we need to try to really question the fundamentals and move them forward. And it will mean evolution of democracy as well. But I believe into more something way more inclusive and participatory. Uh, and I hope it's not going to be towards uh, any form of dictatorship because then I'm likely going to end up in jail or against the wall because, you know, I keep on uh, 
talking is. And one last f- fast comment to the air pollution. Yes, especially in the Slovak context, it is confusing. Uh, you can often hear politicians mixing up those two and not understanding and being able to tell them apart. And in some ways, that is a problem. And in other ways, it isn't. Uh, it is a problem when we're talking about the fact that we need to deal uh, with the air pollution uh, caused by, for example, burning low quality fuels in the, uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the heating, uh, especially in the in the home heat uh, in in the poor regions, and no, it's not the solution. If you say, "Hey, let's replace it with gas," because it doesn't have the level of pollutants, no, we have to really take the problem fundamentally on and try to start from energy efficiency first, so using less fuels, then looking in alternative sources, and only if those two are not able to do it, plug in a bit of gas. So it's about really trying to push then and how to change the narrative to uh, the solutions, not replacing the worst with the second worst, but replacing the worst with the best. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Eva, uh, if you want to react on this, maybe uh, I had one question which is related to what Martin said. Uh, Humans are hardwired for stories with uh, happy ends or at least some ends, some definite ends. Uh, what Martin said is that we don't know. We don't know if we succeed uh, to, uh, in uh, fighting the climate change. We don't know if the uh, the system that we have now is the best uh, suited for that. Uh, so this not knowing, this uncertainty, uh, do you think uh, it makes the communication uh, uh, of the climate policies more difficult, uh, or um, it could uh, it makes them uh, less convincing? Um, so if you want to react on this. You're asking me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, what I was just um, wondering when Martin talked about a wise dictatorship, um, I find myself in very, very uh, frustrated, upset times. I find it very tempting to believe in such a wise dictatorship and think like this could be a very smart quick fix. And um, I, I have come to believe in this idea of uh, prefigurative politics and seeing this as a process, because obviously we're not going to wake up one day and say, oh, okay, now everything, all the problems have been solved. And seeing the process already as a way to practice, for example, collective decision making and um, other ways of cooperating. And um, I work in many projects that try to organize in different collective forms. And I um, find it interesting to see how we can find different ways of organizing on a societal level and um, make this way already a process. And about your, uh, your question about whether it's, um, could you say the question again? How, the, how our story is being changed uh, by yes. the uncertainties? Mm, yes, I mean, uh, what Martin was saying that uh, we don't know uh, a lot, many things. I mean, we know the uh, how the climate change is happening. We know the physical laws more or less now. Uh, we know the, the process, but we don't know how it will end. We don't know if it will succeed. We don't know how it would change our society. So uh, this uncertainty, how it's influencing the ability to, to convince people that the change is needed, basically. Um, Well, I think there's a lot of potential in the uncertainty. When we talk about storytelling, there is this idea of show, don't tell, and don't tell people this is the final solution, but actually give them the possibility to create their own narrative. So I think in um, creating stories around hope and other possible futures, we invite people to also become creative themselves and look for their own solutions. So for me, this is not about us being responsible to put this final answer, or this final solution, which I think we also see now on the political level, this frantic search for, all right, maybe we can establish some kind of green capitalism and then we can solve our problems. And obviously we're not gonna, we're not gonna get there soon enough and it's also not gonna work. So I think what we can do is to inspire people to uh, This also has to do with, again, our way of learning to become democratic citizens and actually learning to think about what kind of world do we actually want to live in. 
and this also has to do with the cognitive dissonance that Brian talked about, that we also appeal to people to ask themselves this question, what kind of life do I want to lead? What kind of person do I want to be? What kind of hopes do I want to dream? And how does that fit to the lifestyle that I lead today? And for me, the uncertainty is a great possibility for us because I think nobody expects anybody right now to have any final answers. I think it will also be, um, I'm missing the English word, but it would also be uh, quite daring to, um, to consider yourself as having answers. Okay, thank you. Brian wanted to chip in, uh, so I'll give him uh, the word and then Thorsten, yes. Yeah, Brian. just uh, responding to, the, to the, the idea of the green, uh, 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 the idea of, of giving up democracy. I don't think giving up democracy is on the table, but I think we do have to consider, you know, there's a lesson in, in COVID, I think, in the, uh, the trade-off that we sometimes have to make between personal freedoms and collective survival. And uh, I think what's playing out right now in the US in this debate about masks as being an impringement on personal freedom um, is perhaps a fractal example of some of the choices we may have to make. And consumerism may mean you know, that we have fewer choices, but um, if that means the survival of our children, then that's, that's something else. You know, I read Jared uh, Diamond's Collapse um, uh, back in 2005 when it came out. And when he talked about the Viking settlement in Greenland collapsing because the Vikings do not eat fish. They only ate you know, the livestock. And Greenland couldn't support their livestock. They were in the middle of the richest fishing ground in the world. And that civilization failed. And I remember George Bush saying, the American way of life is not up for negotiation. And thinking, oh, you know, that's exactly the attitude that uh, that led to that society's collapse. And I think we all need to be ready to compromise to um, to 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 get to the end goal. I'm forgetting to unmute. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Thorsten, uh... I um I just wanted to comment um two or three uh, shortly two or three points that were raised. Um, the, the uncertainty is for sure also an opportunity to tell good stories and to be creative. But in the context of climate communication, it is also a serious obstacle. And we are working at, here at the university now about a whole lecture. We have a lecture about sustainability, an open lecture, and the main topic is only uncertainty. And um, it, it's one obstacle that you have to overcome somehow when you want to bring your message to people that are not within the bubble. Then they would always even deniers would always come with these arguments that climate um, uh, scientists are working under uh, serious uncertainty and um, the messages are uncertain yes but one thing you can do is then compare it with a lot of other uncertainties we have accepted in our daily life so we drive a car even if it's quite uncertain and so you, you can somehow find um, comparisons and then it makes somehow people easier to accept and to understand that uncertainty is a daily basis of our life and to cope with it also within communication. So this is really important to find also examples of our daily life to somehow ease climate communication. Um, and then one, I, I love this show and don't tell because this is exactly what I teach my students here when we do reportage, a lot of climate reportage. And um, we have a serious and dramatic longing and demand for a return to nature in our societies for more over 10 years, a, re a certain reunification with nature. You see it on very different levels, all these books about nature, nature writing. We have a German forest manager who wrote, wrote a lot of books in different language. We have all these countryside magazines with a dramatic uh, message of nat natural beauty so um, somehow our language also, when it comes to tell, show, so show the beauty of this world, show, and but don't tell it, don't explain it in an intellectual way, but just show. And that's somehow intellectual and academic perspective. The question is how, what, what makes a difference? And I can give you one example. The difference is all these docu documentaries about nature in the last 15 years, quite successful. Um, about the seas, about the rainforests, plastics, whatever, um, about nature, not about plastics and uh, environmental. Um, a lot of them were completely decontextualized because they were only showing what people are longing for, the beauty of nature, escapism, and also a, um, a 
kind of a beautiful world they could hide in. But when we succeed in combining this um, escapism that it has to do with the longing for nature with the transformative discourse, then the story gets really powerful. We have a lot of um, strong narratives within an escapistic framework. And within this framework, we have to look for the transformative potentials. And then you easy come, easily come to the local um, places, to the stories, the trusted communicators' needs. And so one combination I found in my work is when it comes to what, what um, Brian said a lot, um, that you have to, and this is based on George Marshall because he uh, has this basic idea of shifting the values, hacking um, the, the um, mainstream culture is, is great. And I, my, my, somehow my finding based on this was to work with old knowledge and new people and on new knowledge and old people. So when you turn this, um, for example, an old knowledge, and we are more and more working within environmental sciences about something that is called traditional ecological knowledge. It's called tech. It means to be more indigenous on the other, on the one hand, but also to be more local in our studies, in our findings, in our communications. And when you discover what is really the knowledge, what is the story in a specific community, in a specific forest, in a specific landscape, and you discover even that maybe you would have to change to the local dialect to bring your a message out. I mean, this is an extreme example, but I have just written a book about my local um, river and my woods where I've grown up with a climate context um, to try to combine this homeland approach and the loss of nature, climate consequences with the approach to write about the beauty of it, to write about the river as a being. And then you can discover that it's sometimes easy to overcome these obstacles once you find to a way to overcome the local conditions the local obstacles and this is very much has to do with um to find the old knowledge and to bring it together with new people scientists ngo people journalists whatever or just to turn it to to have um uh, then um new um um new knowledge like climate ideas from um think tanks and to bring it to the older people to i don't know um whoever there is, I mean, local um, clubs, fishermen, hunters, the older people. And yeah, that's that's something that is uh, part of my work. Okay, thank you. In the meanwhile, we have a batch of new questions here. Uh, so uh, there are there are two, uh, basically three, but I think we can put two into one. So first one was directly uh, to Eva, uh, and it's the question of how, of how to cope with the anxiety, because obviously this is not going to get away when we talk about the anxiety about the state of the planet. Uh, this will probably strengthen. So uh, how to cope with the anxiety about the state of the planet if this cause of anxiety is not going to go away, uh, but it will keep getting worse. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, also the question of, of how to turn it into kind of a, a positive motivation for, for change. Uh, the second question is related to the communication uh, of, uh, of climate policies uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to low-income people, basically. Uh, and there was another question there, uh, or it was rather common saying that uh, environmentalists and experts are far away from people, so they cannot communicate actually successfully to, so to say, uh, normal local people, uh, uh, general population, people without any specific uh, specific expert uh, expert knowledge. Um, so these are two questions. So one, how to work with the anxiety, and the other one is uh, how to communicate to uh, to low income groups. Uh, uh, and there are two more questions from Robert, but as he's participating uh, in the panel, I think he can ask him uh, ask those questions himself. So Robert. Okay, I wasn't prepared for it. Okay, uh, one is actually quite similar to what you asked Eva or Eva, yeah. All of you spoke about uh, this dilemma or um, prioritizing hope over fear, but uh, that's, a, that's a real dilemma because uh, as obviously fear is a very deep emotion. It's like the evolutionary emotion. Uh, so how do you combine or is it, to what extent is it right to, that you have to, in order to mobilize the people, you have to dr dramatize the situation. Or wh what's the right uh, balance between uh, hope and doom? Uh, because obviously you have to show people that if they won't do something, 
it will get worse for them. So what, what, how would you, maybe it's a question for, for most of the panelists, what, what kind of a balance or uh, comb combination of doom and hope is, is the right mixture for the communication? And the second question is for Eva, it's about habits. Uh, you, you said uh, it's very hard to change habits as well. Habits are the main operating system of humans, of how, how we work. So um, showing, showing future gains from changing habits may be too abstract, too far away from the comfort of today habits, because I mean, that, that's, that, that, that's the, 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 con the contrast, the, the problem. So what, what would you say works as a motivation for changing habits, which comes back to the first question, of course, you can show real progress that is showing results, or you can do it by a cultural change, make ec ecological behavior cool and consumerism uncool. So what, what would, would, would be your approach to this? Thank you. Hmm? Not easy, Thank not you. easy, <laughs> but. <laughs> this is not an easy panel anyway. That's why so, we have you here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So I think we can start with Eva because some of those questions were directed to you. Uh, and then the others, if they want to chip in, uh, so please. Okay, um, thank you for the question. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I'll start with the anxiety. Um, I personally have made a lot of very good experiences with the work of Joanna Macy. Maybe some of you know Deep Ecology. And I um, try to create spaces in my life where I um, invite those more uncomfortable emotions, like for example, grief and anxiety and fear. And um, I see as a psychologist that many of us, especially when it comes to climate catastrophe, which is so big and complex that many of us don't really know what to do because most people are smart enough to know that simply changing to whatever I mentioned, the um, reusable coffee cup before, is not going to actually save the world. So um, for me, it's about inviting those emotions and then... Um, trying to derive action from it instead of turning away or saying, okay, this is not my responsibility to act, it's the politicians, I'm actually not such a big influencing factor or whatever. There's a lot of emotional coping strategies out there that we could use and really trying to be honest to myself and say, okay, I want to use some problem-focused emotions uh, coping strategy and really trying to do something about it. Um, I try to do that in groups to get support from other people. I try to also... Uh, create a positive environment around it um, with, I think, for example, Extinction Rebellion did a very good job. I have my doubts about Extinction Rebellion, but they did an amazing job in creating an inspiring, colorful, inviting big movement for people, um, different to other climate justice movements that were focused on, for example, collective disobedience, which did also amazing wor work, but were not as inviting to people. And um, I see that often in environmental psychology, there's this differentiation between negative emotions and positive emotions. And for me, it's super important. This is also why I didn't use these words when I talked through the slides, um, that all of these emotions are just as much important. And um, it's impossible to say, okay, I want to be numb on the one sphere of the emotions and I'm going to act on the others. So with the positive emotions, the negative emotions come so the more uncomfortable emotions come with and as I said before anger is definitely super relevant because it really drives people and I think that grief and fear and anxiety we can invite and actually uh, try to give space to to experience those emotions and then also act upon those and I also notice for myself that um, I don't need to to for example know all the things that happen out there to become active my personal experience is that i got pulled into um climate justice actions because of other people because of my social environment because of maybe an idea of my own identity of other factors that were not ah, okay i read about the connection between co2 emissions in the atmosphere and climate change and this is why i started to blockade a mining digger or whatever I started to get into these actions and then little by little, I also got the information. I thought, okay, this is why I'm doing that. But I think that for example, social influence is such a big pulling factor to have a community that I can join and that, um, that gives me a possibility to get active. And this is also what we see now, which is the big problem, I think, 
that a lot of the climate justice movements out there, like, for example, Fridays for Future or Extinction Rebellion, pointed out a problem and said, listen to the scientists, this is the problem and this is what we're going to do, we're going to go into the streets. And this is, I see now a, a fatal thing for the climate justice movement that we had a coping strategy which was problem focused, which was going out to the street to do collective action. And this now, we're accepting that we're not doing this right now, or we're doing it different, uh, in a different way. And um, I see that this is in a way problematic because now people again get pulled into trying to use emotion, emotional focused coping strategies. This is about emotions and um, about habits. As I said, it's, it's hard for us. It had a, a high cost in a way. It has a high cost for us to, to change our habits. It's, um, it takes a lot of energy and we only have a limited capacity to change these habits. Um, I think there's one of the very big things that I like to work with is again, triggering this cognitive dissonance and trying to uh, inspire people by asking them what kind of life they want to lead and then making them remember, okay, this, my, my lifestyle right now actually doesn't fit so much. Um, and also psychology would say there's little things that you can implement in your own daily life, like rewarding yourself for little things that you do or um, only establishing habits already on the paper saying, okay, what do I want to do? When do I do it? What do I do if something else pops up? So you can already in a way, do these habits before you actually do them. What I find problematic with that is that habits obviously is a very individual um, thing to do. And I think individual lifestyles are important, but uh, it draws away the focus on, okay, we, we need a systemic change. It cannot be that I'm surrounded by big discounters full of cheap meat and plastic and whatever, and I need to make this super big effort and do all the psychological tricks that I can think of to actually cycle to this organic, vegan, plastic-free store somewhere, and then I need the money to buy these things. This is a system that is just in its roots already so unsustainable and so unjust that I, I think habits in a way are very relevant when we talk about individual um, lifestyles. But also, I think the focus is, um, is problematic because how can I grow up learning these unsustainable habits and then needing to make the effort to break those habits? Shouldn't I have learned different habits in the first place? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Brian was raising his hand. Uh, so Brian and Martin then. Uh, just a huge yes end to, uh, to Ava, my experience of becoming an, an environmentalist was actually going to what I thought was a concert, but turned out to be a rally, um, the No Nukes rally in the 1970s. But, you know, I liked the vibe and I liked the tribe. And it, this really goes down to what I think is absolutely key to this question of, you know, the, the future payoff of addressing climate change may well be much too small to switch to that, you know, reusable drink container. But the social proof and the sort of camaraderie that you get from being a part of a group that is taking that action together, I think is, 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 is something. And when you pair that with the sense of personal agency, um, you know, if you're trying to address the fight or flight mechanism, people's sense of whether they're gonna fight or not is based on whether they think they're going to make a contribution. And when we talk about, yes, that reusable drink container is not gonna save the planet on its own, but when every time you refill a water bottle in a busy airport or a park, you're setting an example that makes that the norm and you know subconsciously primes other people to follow your example, then you're giving people a sense of agency and a sense of, of, I can do that. That's an easy thing that I can do. And I think that's those two things, the social proof, the camaraderie of working together and the sense of agency are the, the immediate payoffs that you can focus on. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I agree uh, and thank you for, the, for those comments. I just wanna say it from a slightly different perspective again one one for me kind of uh, example they used from slovakia uh we often think about the ability of people to adjust from uh, their actions from uh, let's say mostly privileged perspective of having the the financial ability and having the availability of alternatives uh there is a small town called nizhna slana in uh, slovakia in kind of the central south more towards the east uh, former mining town, uh, the mines are closed um, since 
quite a number of years. Uh, very high poverty. Uh, most of the uh, most of the people from the town go to work to Rozhneva, which is some 20 kilometers to the south. Now, what they take there are old secondhand, predominantly German diesel cars. To tell them that, hey guys, you know, you shouldn't go, you know, you should have electric car or you should go with something else. You know, this is this is polluting. Or actually come up with, you know, we need to address the pollution there. So let's increase the taxes on the diesel and let's try to ban the uh, and uh, the, the old diesel cars. This is exactly wrong. This, the, the system doesn't allow them alternatives because you know what? The availability of affordable effective and economic public transport is not there. They don't have alternative. We're coming from a point of thinking that the alternatives are available to everybody. They're not. The system is not offering it. That's the problem. We need to change the system so people even have a choice uh, because at the moment they don't. And the second thing is only when we give and when we when we push the system to offer alternatives, to, to, be, to have effective alternatives, and let's not talk about, okay, you know, but this is going to cost us, this is going to need subsidies. We're subsidizing in the European Union the fossil fuels by 50 billion euros every year. Fossil fuels. So if we change it, then people will have alternatives. And then we can start talking about not just the carrot, but the stick and try to push the people away from using certain things. But I think that's where, for me, the... You know, I praise and, and support the individual behavior change. This is really important, but it's not gonna matter sadly without a system change. And I think this is where the kind of uh, the communication that we often hear: "Oh, we all have to change our habits." We will if the system will change. I would not rely so much on uh, it's gonna be so hard to push people to do things. No, people adapt. We need the system to change first. Okay, Torsten, if you uh, want to add something, maybe I would have one additional question because this is uh, something, uh, at least for me, it's interesting uh, how the, uh, let's say, lifestyle media had taken up uh, the issue of environmental or climate change, uh, environmental risks. So, so quite often you can see now articles there uh, that are talking about the uh, uh, conscious, uh, conscious uh, consumerism, about the uh, buying uh, bio food and so on. Uh, uh, and these articles are completely lacking, let's say, the uh, systemic part or the, uh, uh, the, the more general picture. So uh, uh, what's from your perspective? Uh, um, I mean, is this, is this the way how to communicate these issues to, uh, let's say, general reader who is not so much interested in, in, in more, uh, in more uh, systemic um, issues, uh, who is not interested in um, uh, kind of uh, environmental policies and so on? Or is it the way uh, of uh, basically uh, misleading the reader into believing that um, only a small change of behavior could change the world? Um, so you, I was, yeah, I can try to answer this also shortly, but I wanted to somehow jump back shortly to this um, fundamental question of the right combination of doom and hope, as Robert was um, uh, pointing it out. Um, I think um, what is from a perspective of a journalist or somebody who's um, trying to tell stories of change or to, to teach it is, is um, to never end a story with um the doom message, sometimes it can be a, a way to gain um, uh, attraction to make people, to, to wake them up somehow. But um, the right combination is to have maybe some, I mean, doom is a hard word, but to have some um, perspective, some message of disaster in, but then to end with hope. And actually it's not only about hope, what I mean with const uh, constructive journalism or constructive communication, there is different positive, let's say positive elements like hope, like success, like solutions, like role models, so heroes. And there is a difference between um, naive hope and uh, somehow some, some kind of checked and um, trusted hope and solution and success. And people have a sense to uh, make the difference between this naive hope that the world is going to change within uh, one or two years and whatever, and, um, and what is a, a success that is already working, what is a, a proven um, approved solution. So um, 
when we talk about this constructive journalism in uh, relation to the whole climate debate, then it's uh, the, the important thing is to not lose the critical framework as a journalist, for example, to be critical and also critical with a solution and with the idea to, to investigate if it can be a solution in the real world, if it can be um, uh, on the market, for example, when it comes to a product. Um, so this is, I think, very important to, to um, think about this difference between this naive kind of naive thinking of, of hope and, and, well, and the changes that are necessary. And, but and on the other hand, to, to see um, if it's proven, if it's checked, if it's somehow feasible. And um, yeah, I think one thing we should never forget what is also convincing somehow people who are not so much interested, which should, could be a small answer to your question, is to have just the, the economy in. It costs what it costs to not do something like climate change. I mean, this is a very old answer, way old way to convince maybe people who are not within the bubble. But in Germany, it's, it's like 168 billion um, euros a year and this uh, comes from 2016 so it's, this is still something quite quite a simple um, method somehow to or a simple element to bring in the, these debates is what it costs not to do something because money is still something people even if it's a dominant narrative and it should be uh, also balanced with other ones but it's still an important one so um, and I think what is also important to make people um, understand um, how important it is that it, it, it's a question of a fundamental shift of a systemic um, transition we have to do is to go back to earlier um, examples like uh, abandoning slavery, for example, um, um, given um, women's right to women right to um, speak, to um, vote, to be much more powerful. I mean, we have a lot of success in different fields of society within the last, yeah, let's say three, four or 500 years that make that, that encourage us somehow also to, to be more open to be successful also in with this, this task to have, um, uh, be successful with the ecological shift. So I think these kind of comparisons with earlier examples and other fields like uncertainty, okay, we have it in different fields of our lives, so why not here? What is so special about it within the climate context? This helps to somehow understand that it's, it's, it's feasible. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have, again, a couple of questions and we are approaching the last round of questions. So uh, there is one question, which is actually, it's not a focus uh, of, uh, of this discussion. And it's about the uh, basically scientific uh, scientific explanation for the climate change or man-made climate change uh, and uh, alternative explanation that is just uh, a normal fluctuation of, of global temperature uh, on the earth. Uh, I mean, this is not the focus I mean, to, to talk about the, uh, 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 to talk about the uh, scientific uh, explanations of relation between the uh, um, uh, CO2 emissions or greenhouse gases emissions, which are man-made and the climate change, but it leads me to a question. Uh, after like tens of years, we can say 30 or 40 years of uh, more and more convincing uh, scientific explanations of the man-made climate change, we still have these stories circulating uh, about alternative explanations, about uh, possibility that this is not uh, a man-made disaster, this is just a natural disaster, or it's not happening at all. So do you think this is a matter of uh, insufficient information uh, that people have, or uh, it's uh, the, the problem is somewhere else. Uh, and then we have two more questions, which are again from the registration formals. Uh, the one is uh, whether we could borrow something from the commercial advertising or commercial communication uh, uh, if we want to communicate successfully uh, the uh, the climate uh, climate policies. Uh, and uh, the second question relates to the role of municipalities, because these are the ones who are close to people. Uh, on one hand, uh, we can see many successful examples of, of climate uh, responsible policies on the municipal level. On the other hand, uh, at the municipal level, uh, there could be, a, sometimes there is a strong, uh, uh, strong uh, pressure against uh, changes uh, to local economy, which is based on coal mining and so on. So what's the role of municipalities and how should we work with the uh, with uh, mayors, uh, people from the municipality, uh, uh, 
when communicating the climate change. And there is one more question uh, in the Q&A, uh, but I will leave that one uh, for, for the last round. So please, uh, we can start probably uh, with, uh, with Martin uh, or, yes, let's start with Martin. And then we'll just, whoever wants to chip in. I pick up the, the, the last one in terms of the communication with the municipality. I think uh, we, here we have we have to uh, recognize the distinct differences uh, between municipalities. So when one mentions, okay, municipality where the economy is heavily reliant on, let's say, coal extraction, the way to deal uh, with the issue of climate change is different than a municipality that it's not. And uh, we have to find a way to adjust each of them. Now, the one that is highly dependent on the extraction of fossil fuels, let's say, uh, a coal mining region, uh, this is about more complex, let's say, but also um, a very important societally discussion about just transition. How do we go from point A to point B, especially since it has overwhelming impact on um, on the economy of, of the region? Although, as we see in the Slovak case, it's actually a bit absurd sometimes because the coal mining is sustained only to uh, subsidies by the entire country. So in some ways, uh, where is justice in that for, the, for everybody else in the country where, you know, we are supposed to pay to keep those people in job. And actually the costs are twice as much as if they would sit at home and do nothing and receive the same salary. Uh, but it's a specific case. And I think the, the work there really needs to be more systemic and looking at uh, how to, to start a transition for away um, from uh, fossil fuel extraction in a just way, while one has to recognize that since it's kind of usually a, a big employer in the region, uh, such a company or companies have a substantial power over the local population, over the local landscape, and are very important stakeholders, very powerful stakeholders. So it's not an easy situation. Uh, they often push their employees to kind of be part of the counter narrative threatening by them by losing the jobs. So the the but on the other hand, the 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 communities when this is not the case, which is the majority of the communities, I think. Uh, this is, uh, there are ample positive things. You know, every, if you look at the election campaigns uh, on a municipal level, especially within the cities, the amount of uh, green spaces is usually one of the top headlines of every election campaign. We will bring more trees, we'll bring more green stuff. And then they fail uh, in the promises and bring more roads and parking lots. Uh, so I think the issue is in the public domain. The issue is being used. It's more about now getting it from empty election promises into, into a real action and into more, more systemic action. Uh, and that's, I think, where, where the trick lies. What's going to be hard is uh, the transportation issues, uh, but that's, again, something which can be handled by pushing for uh, um, alternatives and actually providing the infrastructure for uh, of, for alternatives. Um, so that's that's in a nutshell. I don't want to kind of spend too much time going through the others. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Yeah, to the question of can we steal from the advertising world? Yes, absolutely. Um, and the the world of psychology as well. I was so glad to see you know Ava doing work on the interface between psychology and environmental activism. Uh, as I mentioned to her, it was 30 years that I was working for one of the largest environmental groups in the world before I got introduced to persuasion science and behavior economics and this incredibly rich field that advertising knows cold. And, you know, we've really got to get better. Martin and I had the experience of a of campaign he worked on where we brought somebody in, we hired somebody who came from a marketing background um, to deal with toxic uh, chemicals in the fashion industry and whoa, transformed the campaign because he knew how to speak to the fashion audience. And it was extremely controversial in Greenpeace because it is a foreign language. It doesn't speak to our values. It, is, it looks completely alien, but it worked. And um, we really need to joyfully steal from those uh, 
those uh, persuasions that are that are out there that are really really good at getting people to change their behavior. Thank you, uh, Eva. If you want to add something. Uh, yes, I just uh, wanted to answer again to this question of information. I think we've, uh, many of us, at least, um, I know that uh, Torsten, Brian also already um, mentioned the information deficit hypothesis and this idea of do we actually still lack information. And I feel, I mean, we all know since the, I would say 1970s, maybe even earlier, we have been told that we have a problem, especially when it comes to our emissions and climate change and climate catastrophes. And I would say, at least in the Western world, our education systems, our awareness campaigns, politicians, communicators, all made good enough effort to tell people that there's a problem out there and that we need to change something. I think that the lack of knowledge here is really not the problem. I sometimes even feel like I have too much knowledge. I sometimes feel like it's so complex. There's so much that I almost, that it's tempting to just withdraw. And as I said before, for me, I think information was not really the basis of my action. I think there was a lot of action that came before I had. I, I know, for example, for me in Germany with the anti-lignite uh, movement, I was part of the anti-lignite movement for so many years. And over the years, I learned all what the mining industry, extractive industries all over the world, the consequences in Germany and globally. I didn't know all these things when I started. And I feel like there is... Um, almost a danger of having too much information. And I think the work on, as Brian also said, for example, social norms, our lifestyles, our other, um, yeah, the the, uh, the people around us, what we see, what we can do is a lot more important than providing people with more knowledge. Um, yeah. And okay. I feel uh, also because when we talked about anxiety earlier, I feel like... Um, for me, it's about joining positive action for its own sake and saying, I want to do this regardless of what I think are the consequences and how I define a successful action. Do I define a successful action because because a, um, because a power plant was stopped for a few hours or because we had a good time or because many people say they are going to join another action the next time? So I feel like there's also this matter of what do we actually use as measurements of where's the problem of that, the solution. Okay, thank you, Thorsten. Yeah, I think um, climate communication has a problem of a factual overload. So it's mostly still concentrated on cognition, on the level of information. And um, somehow, even if we have a story hype, not really using storytelling as a, a useful tool to somehow maybe also change behavior. I mean, I, I'm always talking as a journalist, not as a campaigner, which is somehow a difference. Um, but um, there is not any problem of information, of climate information, even of climate knowledge. The question is, if it, if it comes then to uh, repeating the message, if it comes to identification, if it comes to um, sharing the message with other people and then also um, together with other intellectual influential factors, maybe change behavior, change your own behavior, the behavior of groups or even of politicians. That's why we, we, we are um, somehow all hoping a lot that... Um, stories can change the world. I mean, they can change much more than only facts can do. So we have this factual overlord. But what is important to me is that we don't do story for the story, but story for information, which is then also the difference between advertising and journalism. So the factual storytelling to me is always a, um, uh, an instrument to transport information in a better way, in a way that is more interesting, um, that gives us um, also that makes sense. Stories make sense. That's the core of it. That's why we tell stories for all, um, yeah, all um, periods of humanity. But I think to, to the other question, um, uh, so there's no there's no um, uh, problem of information to with the deniers. I, I work sometimes with local municipalities in my area here, especially when it comes to protests against against wind power and windmills. That's a very hot topic here. And I work with NGO and local communities here and different people. And what is, and there you can learn also a lot of how um, for the general 
um, approach how to cope with climate deniers because there's there's a lot uh, in common. And you have to somehow identify the radical deniers um, and the the, uh, the others um, who are skeptical. So there is a radical um, denier, there are radical deniers, and but there's also an open skepticism and you have to separate them clearly. There's no sense in talking with the radical deniers um, and they are not as strong as we sometimes thought them to be, but because of talking about them so often in politics from the German perspective of other countries, we make them stronger because we always thought that we have to convince them and, but to talk with radical deniers to somehow think that you can win this um, discourse by using good arguments means that you always have to repeat the arguments by creating your own argument. But with this, you repeat it and you strengthen the message of this nonsense they are spreading out. So if you are somehow, um, if you somehow see more or less clearly who are the radical deniers, there's not any sense to communicate with them. And, um, but then there's, there's, there's a lot of people, especially in municipalities, who are skeptical, but who are still open. And it's important somehow to know who, um, who they trust in, which is the task to identify in municipalities the key communicators. They can be quite, they can be quite um, different. Sometimes there's a local blogger. Sometimes there's someone running the local Facebook group. Sometimes there is a small local magazine with a real high impact in the, within the local discourse. So once you identify the local key communicators for climate, environment and nature, very important for nature, then you can somehow try to work with them, meet them and, and somehow integrate them in your strategy. But they can be, and this is really different from local community, from municipality to municipality. It's not enough to have the mayor and the local NGO head and maybe the local journalist and then the show um, can go on. No, there are people like, as I said, blockers, older people, smaller, not the daily newspaper, but smaller newspapers who um, don't cost anything. And so there are different communication um, infrastructures in different places and you have to cope with them and uh, identify them and get to know to them. And afterwards you can create your strategy. Thank you. So we have some 15 minutes left for the discussion. Uh, so I think we will just uh, merge last two questions with your uh, with your final comments uh, uh, on the topic. Um, and from the questions I uh, we have now, I, I would pick two. Uh, one is the question on the multiple crises that we are facing. So with the COVID crisis, it seems sometimes that the urgency of uh, of climate change is kind of uh, uh, losing our attention. So uh, the question would be how to, even though, and this is interesting, uh, obviously uh, the epidemics like COVID uh, have, very, have very much in common with, the, uh, uh, with uh, our influence and impact on the environment. So the question would be how to uh, sustain the urgency of the, uh, of the environmental crisis, uh, how to sustain the attention uh, and the urgency to act uh, in the multiplicity of crises that we are facing, uh, especially uh, due to the fact that uh, with the climate change, uh, the crisis will be probably more frequent, uh, more serious. So, uh, so how to how to keep minds focused uh, on the uh, on the uh, ecology? So that's the first question. And the second one, um, uh, if you could recommend uh, a book or a podcast. Uh, that you think is like really useful, uh, interesting uh, for for the topic that we are discussing now. Uh, maybe if you pick one or two, uh, that was the question there, uh, and I think it would be interesting. Uh, and I think we can start in the reverse order. So we will start with Brian, then Thorsten, and Eva, and Martin. So Brian, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think I mean COVID is actually a fantastic sort of practice ground for for addressing climate change and i think there's all kinds of lessons in there you know the effectiveness of collective action you know when we when we saw those those countries that did respond effectively to covid and the collective action having an impact um, that was an extraordinarily powerful lesson in our collective agency and i think that's an important thing to keep in mind for climate change and it also you know it was an illustration of how fast what we consider to be normal can change. 
and how fast that changes behavior. Think of you know what's happened to handshakes and hugs, um, just a, a part of everyday behavior that's 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 simply you know vanished now as a result of of of, of COVID. And you know the idea that, uh, that 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 many countries effectively shut down their economies, something that would have been considered unthinkable. Um, but the idea that there are some things that are priceless, that are worth more than economic growth or profit. And I think all of those lessons ripple out into the climate debate in ways that are actually quite powerful and actually quite positive. Thank you. Uh, Thorsten? Yeah, I mean, th this is exactly what I wrote uh, in my book when I finished it, is what we could learn from COVID um, uh, in the climate perspective and uh, yeah you you already said very important things but the, the message of um being able to reduce ourselves uh, on the individual level but also as a society and also to slow down i was already um underlining the importance of this um time question um this acceleration of life combined with the climate um, question because this is ev this is something everybody would nearly everybody I think would like to have is somehow to slow down to have yeah this this form of life quality and this is exactly what we had to do under a negative um, roof with a very um, serious and dramatic um, starting point but we were able to do it to slow down also to somehow to rediscover nature in a certain way so we, there's a lot we could learn but we could also try to find the common ground there to contextualize the COVID debate with the climate and nature um, context and it comes from it comes from the same area it's the woods so we have some, there were articles in the first month um uh, pointing out that um um, a virus often uh, comes from um, woods where animals are chased and hunted and eaten in southern uh, Asia or in Africa, wherever. We have somehow forgot to find, again, these comparisons. So it's much about protecting our woods, much about discussing um, the wildlife and um, uh, protection, especially in the, in the southern world. And um, so there's a common ground. It's both an ecological crisis, an ecological question, climate change and the COVID crisis. I mean, one answer could be to really protect the rainforest in Brazil because of this um, discovery that somehow it has a common ground. And um, I think um, this, to contextualize all the debates we, are, we have, and COVID is the most powerful with this climate and ecological framework, would be um, something that we have to do steadily. And we, we did it in the first month uh, in media, but somehow we forgot because now the COVID is an own discourse. The question is, and how far do we relate it, contextualizes with other um, narratives, discourses, and debates. And um, the question was to recommend a book or a podcast too. Is that already yes? Book, book, podcast, or even a movie or documentary, something you find truly really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, there is there is this um, British writer Robert McFarlane who's writing a lot about um, landscapes and nature in Great Britain, but also in other parts of the world. And I can recommend his books because they they have this um, special mixture of showing the beauty, not forgetting the disaster. Um, and also reminding us of environmental history, what was already there and what was already well working as a success. And so it's three different, very important dimensions within one language, a poetic language, which is very important to re remind us of the beauty of nature in our language, because our language is so much poisoned by technical expressions. So we have to reshape our language. I was just out with one of the most uh, leading uh, um, NGO people in Germany to um, teach him another language. And we went to a river, we went to the woods and the exercises were completely different from the situation in uh, like here in a room. So it's also about language. So Robert McFarlane map, I, I only have the German titles, but you can look up his, his work. Thank you. And we'll get to the question of the book or podcast with Brian because we had forgotten. <laughs> Yeah, uh, for podcasts, there's something called the You Are Not So Smart podcast, which is an investigation of nothing but cognitive bias and cognitive dissonance. It's fascinating. It's a really, really useful tool. Um, I also mentioned was made, Torsten mentioned uh, George Marshall as well. 
uh, don't even think about it, which is how to communicate climate to uh, conservatives and, and um, uh, people with different value systems. And uh, Winning the Story Wars by Jonah Sachs. Um, absolutely brilliant, brilliant story, brilliant uh, book about the importance of story in society and what's going on right now with this idea of the myth gap that I was talking about earlier. And of course, Sapiens, um, can't recommend it enough. Yuval Harari's amazing sort of satellite view of the history of human society and, and human storytelling. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eva. Uh, first of all, about the question of urgency, I totally agree with Carson and Brian, as in that Corona is a fantastic analogy of accelerated catastrophe that we already experienced and that we can learn a lot from it. First of all, that we are actually able to adapt and transform, transform as, a, as a society and work towards change. There is a theory around a limited pool of worry, they say in psychology, that um, people actually are not able to cope with so many catastrophes at the same time. Um, but studies so far, um, that those that have been done during the last half of the year, have sh uh, shown that most people still consider climate change in the long term as our biggest worry. So people are still very aware of the fact that there is a problem out there. This is also what what we can see and what is in a way um, can give us hope for change. And at the same time, we still see people consider it as a worry and as a big problem, but they don't actually get active. And Torsten just said that we have a story overload. I actually feel like we still tell the same stories that we have been telling each other for decades. And we see that these stories in a way don't really work. So I feel like the stories that we tell, the words that we use, the imagery that we use, also make us come to certain conclusions, identify a certain problem and draw different behavior reactions from it. And in a way, telling always the same stories makes us always react the same way. So for me, it is about telling different stories, also maybe using different communicators. We also now we are again very Western, also if I can say very male kind of group here. So also maybe listening to other storytellers that um, don't get get to the stage so often and um, yeah, giving other other voices the, um, the possibility to be heard. Um, about recommendations of books, I really like um, the work of the, I think it's a story-based strategy that you call. There's a book about reimagining change, which I really like. Uh, I was talking about values. I also like the book, The Common Cause, um, which also, again, um, helps us to use values in a, a useful way. Ah. OK, thank you. Martin? Um, the corona and uh, climate. I have one answer to that. And I think this is uh, because it's a perception that the climate is forgotten, a perception that it's being put out uh, in some extent from the beginning by people who were trying to suppress the climate movement or kind of suppress the climate action. Uh, you could see here in the parliament from, uh, for example, the, the Polish MEPs from uh, uh, the uh, law and order party saying, oh, no, no, and now we need to focus on, on the corona. Let's forget about the climate. And corona wasn't even really an issue at that time yet in Poland. Um, and the answer to that, why it's not true for me, it's in the number 126,000 and something. And what is that? That's a number of signatures under a climate petition in Slovakia that were collected within approximately a month. It's something which when uh, the activists uh, who started it uh, and uh, that were basically young uh, I would call it green influencers. They didn't really belong to any organization. Um, and I was talking with them before they started, and I heard from them the ambition of 100,000. I was like, right, you know, I really hope you make it. But inside of me, I thought, this is, this is not, they're not going to make it. I had my doubt. And then I just, you know, my jaw dropped as I saw the numbers and in coming in, in waves. And this is what is the best answer. You know, whatever this is, people actually do care. 
people actually started to change the narrative in the country, which wasn't really caring about the climate for a very, very long time, which until recently, until a few years ago, besides the attempts of the few international NGOs, didn't have a climate movement. A large part of the environmental movement didn't care about climate, which was ridiculous, but it was the case. And now it is the hot topic, and the number is something which no one has ever achieved in that speed among the environmentally focused uh, petitions. So this is something which is amazing, and it's for me a living proof that actually climate is an issue, and uh, we need to use this tragedy of corona to really fundamentally rethink. Not because of the corona itself. I agree with the with the kind of slowing down and the forest and everything, but that it's something which is only possible to those who can, so to say, afford it. The economical impacts of corona are going to be hitting now in a sense and size, especially in Slovakia, which uh, is unheard of. And I, I think we are ahead of, due to the uh, lack of action by our government, a major societal disruptions. The opportunity is also in the amount of money that's going to be put into the economy for the post-corona renewal. And if we blow this, we're going to have a big problem, uh, at least in terms of a stranded investment into you know, gas, my favorite topic. Now, books. Uh, I'm happy and a bit disappointed that uh, some of you picked some of my books. So this is not, but I got also inspiration. Um, and uh, definitely, I would not say that only the Sapiens uh, is good. The Sapiens is really good, but also the Homo Deus is very good and, and, and questioning. So I'll get on to the uh, brands. I definitely, I want to repeat to all of you, Jonah Sachs uh, and well, How to Win the Story Wars is definitely uh, a must to read. And uh, it was, we had the honor of Brian to work uh, with his agency on, on the detox campaign back in the day. And he was really good in helping us to see how we can tell the story. And uh, I would also recommend you something from uh, more kind of crossover from science to, to communication. And that's obviously George Lakoff and Don't Think About Elephant. I think it's classics by now. But I think it's really good in, in kind of explaining and connecting the biology and the way we work as a species uh, to, to society and how we need to really communicate differently. And for example, what Orson was saying, you know, it doesn't make really sense to go and, and, and repeat the messages of, uh, of hardline climate denialists because you're just reinforcing his or her message. And I think this is exactly what uh, Jonas, uh, what the George Lakov is brilliantly explaining in his book. Uh, and uh, just a few last words, thank you for the opportunity to be here because for me, this, is, this has been actually a discussion which I will have to go back to and watch again. And uh, it doesn't happen often uh, for me to kind of go and watch again panels on which I was a participant. So I uh, really thank you to everybody uh, for fellow panelists because, uh, yeah, very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And you will have a chance to watch it again because it will be posted on Facebook uh, in the afternoon with the interpretation to Slovak. Uh, so let me thank to all the panelists uh, that were present uh, on this discussion, uh, to Martin Hoysik, member of the European Parliament and member of the uh, Progressive Slovakia uh, Party, to Eva Junge, climate psychologist, to Thorsten Schaeffer, professor of journalism specialized on eco-journalism, and to Brian Fitzgerald, story hacker and communications expert, and also to Robert Janoni, who was the initiator of the discussion and who introduced the communication manual, if I can call it like that, um, at the beginning uh, of the event. I will not try to summarize what has been said here because we talked a lot about the uh, need of the holistic approach because ecology is not one of the issues, it's the issue. Um, we have talked also about the uh, uh, need to go local uh, about the fact that we are full of facts uh, and we need to find good stories. So I'll not try to summarize it. Uh, uh, this was, uh, I think, very useful and fruitful discussion. Uh, for the end, I'll just speak on one thing that has been mentioned by Torsten, uh, and it's uh, as the overall overload of facts. Uh, I think uh, uh, on one hand, it's true. Uh, we have now so many facts uh, that we, I think, 
the discussion about the uh, reality of climate change and man-made climate change uh, is, um, I, I think, uh, useless in a sense, because we know it's happening and we more or less know how it's happening. Still, we have this discussion. Maybe it's not a problem with the facts, but with the problem how we deal with the facts. And here I would just uh, offer my uh, advice for, for a book. Uh, I cannot remember the authors, but the book is called Calling Bullshit. Uh, and it's about how to, how to actually navigate in a world full of facts when the correct facts uh, are used uh, uh, for uh, advocating, advocating for uh, for untruth or misinformation and so on, because especially in the area like climate change, uh, which is um, I think which if you want to be an expert on this, uh, you need expertise in different parts of the science. Uh, it's full of black boxes, uh, you know the uh, uh, the processes that you cannot understand. So it's really easy. Uh, it's really easy to uh, to uh, use the facts that we have and create uh, something like a misinformation or disinformation, uh, or at least to use them for a bullshit means straying away the discussion, overloading it with uh, uh, different alternative explanations uh, and hiding uh, basically uh, the problem. Um, okay, so I think we have exhausted the time that we have. Uh, uh, thank you again for for participating. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank uh, thank you very much also for for the participant uh, that participants that have registered for the discussion on Zoom. And um, I hope we will meet again uh, uh, similar topic with the panelists and with you. Thank you and see you later. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.